Okay. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so today, um, as I said last time, I'm going to explain to you um, a sort of new strategy that uh, I have been de developing for the last years. And uh, hopefully it will, um, in some sense, put, put all these uh, things in a more general, um, let's say more um, conceptual setting. And um, hopefully it will um, allow us to generalize these results to, to higher dimensions, right? So essentially what's the problem with uh, the, the previous strategy that I explained to you? So I recall there's, you, there's this two cases where we, we were able to um, prove the resolution of singularities for, for vector fields or foliations by curves. Uh, and uh, so in both cases, we somehow has, has used the, the particular structure um, in the, some particular structure in the, in the ambient space. So in dimension two, there is a, the divisor which somehow uh, guided the, the choice of coordinates. And in dimension three, I had introduced this uh, a new structure called an axis, which um, essentially allowed us to, to control and rigidify the local change of coordinates, right? So the problem is that when you try to, to generalize this to higher dimensions, um, they don't behave so well by blowing up. Okay, so essentially, if you recall, I, I explained to you that when we blow up an axis, so this is essentially a regular foliation, which is generically transversal to the bad locus or the nipotent locus. When you blow up this axis, you would like to have an axis for the, the new foliation, but you have problems in one direction, right? It's the direction given by the, precisely by the, the leaves of this axis. And in, gen in general, in dimension, so in dimension three, we are lucky because these points uh, don't pose any, any other problem, but in higher dimensions, it's not true. So you, at the end, you have to deal with uh, some sort of um, gen uh, sorry, sorry, singular axis. And this doesn't behave so well uh, by, by what we are intend uh, we'd like to do. So, well, I remarked that in passing there is um, um, Herbig Hauser has defined a, a generalization of this notion of flag of uh, axis for higher dimensions. So you can think as, as this. Uh, in our case, we have uh, the, the divisor, which is two dimension, and then an axis, which is uh, one dimensional, let's say sub manifold inside of this two dimensional manifold. And of course, you could imagine that in higher dimensions, you have a sort of flag of surfaces, each one of codimension one inside the, the other one, right? So this should be, let's say, the, the natural generalization, which will redefine re 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 the coordinates. But I, I was not able to make this work uh, nicely in uh, dimension greater than, than three. So this is one of the, the obstacles. And the, the other one is that um, even if you're allowed to, to make this, uh, axis uh, stuff work, the presence of these uh, negative vertices, I recall this, this, um, this is an inevitable uh, phenomenon for, um, for the case of foliations or vector fields, they pose a lot of problems when you try to, to capture the good filtration, right? So essentially speaking, you have to, to look for this uh, good phase in the polyhedron and prove that the, they, they, it defines you uh, an environment which is uh, intrinsic Upper, upper semi-continuous and so on, right? So now, I, uh, so I decided to change completely the strategy and uh, well, let's say restart from the basis. I mean, what, what do we want to do? We want to find an invariant and a, a filtration, which what well, I say the minimal requirements that they are intrinsically attached to the local object, right? And uh, the requirements are that the local blow up which is determined by this filtration, right? So I recall the filtration is a quasi-homogeneous filtration, uh, which is um, somehow um, defined by, by a good choice of coordinates, okay? So the local blow up with the center determined by this filtration should reduce the invariant, right? So this is, let's say the basic requirement. And 
Then there is for the local resolution, then for the global resolution, we'd like this environment to be upper semi-continuous with respect to the analytic or, or the risk topology, depending on the category that you work. And uh, okay, so now I, I, I stated some um, new guiding principle is that we, I don't think that you have to treat separately the case of germs of vector fields and germs of uh, functions. Okay, so in some sense, um, why the treatment should be different for, for, for both of these. So my, my, in my strategy, I would like to treat this, uh, both of these objects in a, an equal footing. I mean that the, the same strategy should work for both. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's say the, the unifying language to, 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 to speak about the, both of these objects is, is to see them both as uh, differential operators. Okay, I'm going to, to explain this. And uh, let's say that um, and by treating uh, these two objects as a differential operator, or more generally treat, by treating any differential operator in a equal footing, in some sense we have, we, we are going to see the things for a more general perspective. And um, uh, I, I, as I go to explain to you, it, it gives us a, a new point of view, which, well, I, I hope will will um, make things more more conceptual and then uh, allow us to define a, a strategy which which don't have don't have these two um, problems here. Okay. So um, why study why study um, singular differential operators in general? Well, there are very natural examples where these things appear. So let me just give an, a, a case of a order two differential operator which appears very often in, in applications. So if you take the Laplace equation on an open manifold, so there is a very well-developed theory for elliptic, oper elliptic operators on compact manifolds. But let's say you have this uh, um, Atia, uh, Atia Singer indexes and um, let's say rock, local resolubi resolubility and so on. But when you try, uh, when you uh, treat uh, open manifolds, then there is a problem uh, on the bar, let's say when uh, we have said this such kind of ends, let's say some part of the manifold, which is non-compact. So we call this an end. So for instance, um, so take a, a Riemannian manifold, you take uh, the Laplace, the Laplace built term operator associated to this, um, to the metric. And uh, of course, we'd like to compactify this object to, to this manifold to, to apply the, the, let's say the classical theory for, for compact manifolds. But when you compactify, uh, the metric usually uh, gets singular on the, on the boundary. Let's say you, you add this new point here, which is a sort of cusp, and the metric becomes singular here. So you, you finish with um, the, the associated Laplacian would be um, a singular operator in this, uh, in this uh, point at infinity. Okay. So now I'm going to, to explain in general what I mean by a differential operator. So this uh, discussion, I, I book mainly, I'm going to work mainly on the case of, um, it's of manifolds, but uh, you can adapt this to, to orbifolds. So for, we consider a manifold, the rear or amorphic, rear or amorphic, and then we have two bundles above this manifold, let's say, and it's called E and F. So a differential operator, between this um, defined by this um, vector bundles is a, is a C linear map, which maps the local sections of the first, the first bundle to the local sections of the second one. Okay, so this is a, a, a sheaf map by, by which I mean that you take the sheaf of local sections of E and it gives you, uh, uh, let's say a section of, uh, of the, of the sheaf of sections of the second one. And this, this is only cellular, okay? So in principle, it, it's not, it's not a, um, a module, let's say it doesn't, it doesn't respect the, the, the structure of, of modules um, with respect to the st uh, structural sheaf. So uh, an easy example, so if you take a, um, a global holomorphic function on the manifold, then the multiplication operator maps uh, the structural shift onto itself simply by, by taking 
let's say, a, uh, a germ F and then multiplying by F. Sorry, it's taking a germ G and then multiplying by F. So you have a, a new germ. And this defines you a linear differential operator of um, which is so-called the multiplication operator. Okay. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, this multiplication operator acts on sections of any two bundles, because if you take um, a section of, um, let's say you take an, a section S of the bundle E, uh, yes, there is a small mistake here. Uh, yeah, I have to change this. Well, well uh, e, e and F should be the same here, so I'm sorry. Okay, so E and F should be the same. And then there is some, um, this map. Uh, yeah, so there's this map which maps the se a section of the first bundle in the se in a section of the second bundle by by multiplying by f on the right. Okay. So now, how do you find the order of a differential operator? Um, so the the multiplication operator is a um, as I, I defined I defined a moment ago is a, a an order zero dif uh, differential operator, and more generally we if you take two, um, let's say, if you take any differential operator, we say that it's sort of order zero if it commutes with the more local multiplication operator. Okay, so by 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 this, I mean exactly the fact that uh, that uh, this phi which appears here should be an O module, by which I mean that it, sorry, it it will be it should be an O. Um, Morsel, in the sense that it respects the the, the, the structure of uh, multiplication by the say of uh, O modules, where O is the structure shift, and it, I, I can I can formalize this by saying that um, multiplying by a function and then applying phi is the same thing as applying phi and then multiplying by a function. So this is what I mean by order zero. Okay, so. More generally, we say that phi is of order d. If it's, if it's commutator with the multiplication operator, okay, with d, d plus one multiplication operators, given gives you zero. Okay, so you can you can think as this this first condition by saying that uh, phi commutes with the multiplication operator, then it's of order zero, and then it's of order d. If it's commutes, if it's commutator with the, if it's d plus one order commutator vanishes. Okay, so that's two examples. So as I said before, a, um, a global differential, a global homomorphic function H defines a differential operator of order zero. Why? Because if you take, because multiplication is commutative, right? So if you, if you multiply by F, and then multiply by H, the same thing as multiplying by H and then multiply by F. So this, this order zero, let's say this shows that multiplication is of order zero. And then a global vector field also defines a, a, a linear differential operator, but now it's of order one. Why? Because, so, okay, so a, a global a vector field acts on the structure shift by, by derivation, right? But when, when you look at the, the, its commutator, with the multiplication operator, okay. So it simply means that you you take a germ G, and then you apply. First of all, you apply the derivation, and then F, or you apply in the other way around, and you see that when you take the difference between these two, uh, by the just by Leibniz rule, is the same thing as applying the multiplication operator minus delta of F on G. And of course, this one is of order zero, right? So we see that a, a differential uh, vector field defines a, dif a differential operator. A vector field defines a differential operator of order one. Okay. So in general, how do you present a differential operator of order d? Locally, uh, if you fix local coordinates, let's say x1, xn on a point, then it's simply given by an expression like this, right? So you have this. Um, um, this now here I, I'm using the most, this multi-index notation as, as, as always. So this is um, d 
over d x1 to the power k1, d over dx2 to the power k2, and so on, where k1, k2, etc., kn is a, a vector whose uh, sum of entries is more or equal than d, right? So, and then there is this uh, phi k here, where, uh, which are matrices of holomorphic maps of rank k times rank of e. So, uh, okay, so this is, um, let's say, the general definition, but uh, for the, this, um, what I'm going to, to say in, the, in what follows, I only consider the case where E and F are of rank one. Okay, so this mean, by this, I mean that E and F are line bundles. So if you want, you can think of E and F as um, sections of the, let's say, as the structure shift itself, the, the trivial shift. But um, in fact, when you start to make, when you start to make these uh, blow-ups, even when we start with the case where phi is a map from the structure shift onto itself, when you make the blow-up, as I'm going to expand, you have to, to twist these uh, line bundles. And this is why I, I need to consider this more, more general setting. Okay, but locally, it simply means that um, uh, you have a presentation like this, where these phi k are germs of holomorphic functions. Okay, but when you take two of these local presentations, let's say the transition between the phi k on one chart and on the other chart is determined by the, the transition maps of these uh, bundles here. So let's say, uh, I'm, not, I'm not at all a specialist on um, on partial differential equation, but let's say some, some kind of problem that you would like to, to answer when treating differential operators, of course, is, is the local resolubility problem. So given, let's say, G would like to find F such that phi of F is equal to G. Okay, so let's say this is the problem that you would like to solve. Then there is uh, this uh, indexes problems where you would like to find the rank of uh, phi and its uh, co-rank like the, in a Tia Singer index theorem. And uh, well, there is uh, also a whole theory to, to, def, to try to define the, the inverse operator, but then you have to, to work in a more general class of functions like the Sobolev functions or, 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 or distributions. And then uh, there's the whole, uh, whole um, calculus to, to, to try to find this inverse operator, which so I call it the pseudo differential calculus. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to just to make a small a general discussion. So again, as we, we, we have seen in the case of um, functions and uh, in the case of vector fields, there is some um, problem of studying the, the object from a global perspective and then from a local perspective. So globally, the problem is, uh, let's say, um, it lies on the on the domain of the, the global global uh, differential analysis. But here, we are mostly interested in, in the case in the problem of studying this operator from a local point of view, right? So, uh, from a local point of view, um, we'd like to say let's say let's give a germ of function g, and we'd like to find a germ of function f such that uh, phi of f is equal to g. And again, we are confronted with this problem of um, the generic versus the exceptional phenomena, right? So even if you place yourself in a point, there is um, some points which are in which the operator is simpler than uh, other ones. So the philosophy is that um, the exceptional case, the, the case where we have this the complicated phenomena, should be uh, of small, of uh, let's say of big co-dimension, right? So the except for a set which are going to define, which they call, let's say, the singular set of the, the operator, the, the, the behavior should be well, well, well controlled. Okay. So just to, to make an analogy, the, the, for the case of uh, order zero differential operators, so this is just a multiplication by a germ F, what I mean by the singular locus is the locus where, um, let's say the foliation defined by f equals to constant is not locally smooth, right? So we know that if you take f as a reduced holomorphic function, okay? So the level sets, the level sets of f are smooth outside um, a 
closed subset of codimension greater or equal than two, which is simply given by the set where the, the differential uh, of F. So yeah, so uh, let's say if you are in ambient, ambient dimensional, yeah, so the, yeah, uh, in, in ambient dimensional two, this is a, I have I've draw, drawn a picture here in, in, in ambient dimensional three. So you see that the, the level sets of F are smooth outside this, um, let's say the crossing of these two axes here. And this, by, for me, this is, um, let's say this axis here is, uh, should be the, the singular set, right? So let's say this is the, the simplest example of a singular behavior. And then we have already studied this case of vector fields where we have seen that um, a vector field is locally rectifiable outside its singular set. Okay, so I, I mean that outside the set where the coefficients of the vector field vanish, vanish, you, you can always find local, a local system of coordinates where the, the vector field is written as d over dx1. And by, by which I mean that, the, let's say, the, the, the associated foliation is a, a locally trivial. But moreover, if you consider this as a differential operator, then, then let's say you can solve this differential operator very easily. So the singular set is the set where all coefficients uh, vanish, as I, 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 I told you. And let's say more general, if you, if you consider differential operators of higher order, there's this uh, cauchy kovalevsky theorem, which is a sort of generalization of this um, um, of this um, flow box uh, theorem in the main, uh, for uh, vector fields, which says that locally, if you're outside um, a codimension one set, which is called um, the, set, the set of totally, which is totally characteristic, then in some sense you can define, um, you can always locally invert your operator by, by this uh, cauchy kovalevsky theorem, analytically. Okay. Yeah, so now the, the, the goal here is precisely to define what we mean by these singular sets. So in some sense, that sh this should be the sets where all these um, theorems here uh, do not apply, right? So these uh, things, uh, what you call, which are this, the, the, let's say the nice behavior. And uh, for the most of the talk here today, I'm going to, to try to define to you what I mean by a singular set for a differential operator of order greater or equal than two. So let's say for, for, for us, um, uh, I, I hope I have convinced you that there is a, a sort of clear definition what, what I mean by singular or more, uh, let's say more precisely by, by nilpotent uh, set for, for, for vector fields. And in some sense, I'm going to generalize this for a differential operator of, of our higher order. Okay, so what's the approach here? What would you like to do? Uh, once we define this, uh, first of all, we should define the singular, singular locus, right? So which generalizes both uh, the case of functions and vector fields. And uh, we expect that the, the local behavior should be simple outside the singular locus, right? And uh, Secondly, uh, we place ourselves in this uh, singular locus, and then we'd like to define a modification on the ambient space, let's say, which goes from M, the pair M phi to M prime, M prime phi prime, uh, where well, let's say phi is, phi is a morphism, let's say, which is proper, uh, restricts to be a morphism outside the singular set. And moreover, such that then, if you take the strict transform of the differential operator by this morphism, I'm going to explain to you how to find, define this, then uh, all the singularities. So of course, uh, as you have seen, we cannot get rid of the singularities. It, uh, it's, all, it's already very clear in the case of foliation by curves, as I, I recall to you that in, in the case that you have, a, for instance, um, a saddle point, you cannot get rid of the saddle point by blowing up because it's um, it all appear again uh, by in the, the strict transformed foliation, but we we don't expect to get rid of the singular set, but that all singularities which appear 
on the singular set of this new operator phi prime should be uh, amenable to some sort of normal form theory. Okay, so this is by by this I mean that we, we should we should have a sort of um, generalization of this Poincaré Dulac normal form theory, which would allow, in some sense, to um, systematically study the singularities which appear in these final models. Okay, so this is uh, somehow the problem. Okay, so uh, this is a, a small confession. Uh, as I said, I, I'm not an specialist in the in the, uh, the theory of general uh, of linear partial differential equations. So I, I have, in some sense, um, a proposition for uh, how this final model should be. But for the moment, um, I'm not. I don't. I'm not aware if they are very, very useful for the, for the theory of partial differential equations. But um, let's say for me, um, as I, I mentioned at the beginning, the idea is, is to put my problem. So the, the, the goal from the start for me is to, to treat the case of um, foliation by curves. And uh, by adopting this more general perspective, I, I think that I can put the things in, in a more um, conceptual framework. But of course, it would be very interesting to see if this, this final model, which appear for the case of more of higher order differential operators, are useful for the theory of uh, partial differential operators. Um, okay. Well, I, I I've, I've said that I, I don't know I, I don't know the theory sufficiently well to, to see how these um, things are are useful. But there is um, a thing called the B calculus, which has been proposed by by Mel, Melrose Richard Melrose. So you can. I, you can see this reference here is um, this, his ICM, his paper in, in the proceedings of the ICM in the, in the 90s. And in this paper, he's propo he proposes um, a theory of a pseudo differential calculus for manifolds which with corners, right? So this is a, a more or less the, the, the setting that I'm, go I'm, I'm going to treat here by, 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 by what I'm going to explain. And uh, okay, so, so it, it would be interesting to, to compare, uh, let's say, the, the objects that he treats here with uh, the objects that, uh, that we find um, by this uh, procedure that I would like to explain. Yeah, so this is a program, okay? And uh, of course, it's not complete for the moment, but um, let me just give you a, a, a sort of. Um, list of known cases so for the case of zero, of order zero differential op operators. So this, I mean, by germs of functions. What I mean by this uh, steps one and two is this is just a consequence of Hironaka's uh, resolution of similarities, right? Because you, you just, uh, essentially what you do is you, you just eliminate the, the singular set of, um, of the germ by, by using Hironaka's uh, theorem. So at the end, the, the final models correspond to the fact that uh, locally, your function should be given by a, a monomial. Okay. And again, for order one differential operators, this is the case of vector fields that I have this, you have discussed before. Uh, so the, the reduction of singularities, or more precisely, the, the elimination of the nilpotent locus is known to hold uh, for the mention of M at most equal to three. Okay. And in this case, the, the, the final models are precisely the, the element, what I call the elementary singularities, by which I mean that um, when you, you look at this, um, this expression, uh, you should have um, at least one non zero eigenvalue in the linearization of a vector field at the point. Okay. So let, let's, to put the things more or less uh, schematically, you have this, you have this uh, thing here. So I have a diagram where you put vertically the dimension of the embedded space. And now horizontally, I put the, the order of the differential operator that I'm going to treat. So I say uh, Hironaka's um, result says that you, if you consider order zero differential operators, the program holds in, in any dimension. So the bendikos seidenberg theorem, which I recall is this resolution of singularities theorem for vector fields in dimension two. So it says that if I have differential operators of order one, then you can go up to the uh, to dimension two here, right? So the result that I explained to you um, 
in the last sections shows that you can always treat the you can also treat the case of uh, order one differential operators on uh, let's say ambient dimension three and um, well what i know to do up to now is uh, this okay so now uh, with the method that i'm going to explain you can treat any order differential operator in uh, on surfaces Well, um, to, to be completely honest, um, the, let's say the, the new method allows us to prove this, um, let's say this um, resolution of, uh, of singularities for any order differential operators, but this could also be achieved by a more um, direct method with uh, the ideas which are quite similar to the ones that I have explained um, in the first sections, I mean, by, by looking just to the Newton polygon of the differential operator, and I'm going to explain how to define this and apply the, the techniques that I have explained before. So let's say in this, for the dimension up to two, you could also achieve this result by more traditional methods. But the idea for me is just to, 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 to try to use the, use the low dimensional case as a test to show that this strategy can work also in this, let's say, in this um, higher dimensional situation where everything is is open, uh, for to my knowledge. Okay. So of course, for me, the, the idea is just to to uh, use these techniques, uh, but hopefully to to, to fill up uh, the, the the blank region of this this, this diagram. So again, there is. Let's say for, from the, the general perspective, there is not a very, there's not too much change with respect to, to the previous um, um, strategy in the sense that there is a, a combinatorial object, which is sort of Newton polyhedron, which will guide us uh, to, to find this uh, invariant and also the filtration, which allows to define the, the local strategy. Okay. But now we are going to, to adapt a, a more abstract language, which is a very, let's say, to, to keep an analogy with, uh, which is what uh, a theory which is, which is called the geometric invariant theory. Okay, I'm going to explain this in a moment. So in fact, the geometric invariant theory is a theory which allows us to study the quotient of a vector space under the action of a reductive group. I go to give an example for you. So this is a theory which has been, uh, let's say, started by by very cl classical problems, um, like uh, how uh, how to put um, a polynomial, uh, um, an homogeneous polynomial in a in a normal form under the action of linear chains of coordinates on its uh, and, and let's say, or, or the Jordan normal form theory is also an example of a, of a problem treated by the geometric invariant theory. I'm going to, to give you an example in a moment. So there will be some, some definitions now. Um, so again, I denote by OM the locker ring at a point on the manifold. And I'm going to introduce um, this, um, a module of endomorphism. So what's an endomorphism? It's just a map which sends the locker ring into itself, which is continuous, okay? So it's continuous with respect to, we can define this, I'm not going to enter too much in the detail, but you, have, you, have, you can define this notion of continuity by using families of uh, semi-norms, okay? So you can uh, use some structure of um, Frechet structure on the, on the set of, of germs of function. So uh, it's an endomorphism which maps the local, the let's say the structure sheaf onto itself. And moreover, which satisfies this condition that there exists a, an integer L, possibly negative, such that a phi, so an endomorphism should map the, the K, for which map the kth power of the local ring, sorry, of the maximal ideal to the k plus l power of the maximal ideal for each k greater or equal than zero. Okay, so this uh, endomorphism, it can translate the, the kth power of the maximal ideal, 
but not from a, a, a huge amount. Okay. Well, in the case where this L equals to zero, we say that the differential, that this endomorphism is uh, local. So by which I mean that it should map, it should preserve the filtration of the local ring given by the successive powers of the maximal ideal. Okay, so in the case where L equals to zero, phi should map the kth power of the maximal ideal to the kth power of the maximal ideal for each k. Yeah, so now inside this endomorphism, uh, the set of endomorphisms, we have the, the derivations, which are nothing else than the, the uh, particular, I call the local derivations, the, the, uh, a sort of particular subset of endomorphisms, which satisfies the Leibniz rule. So, of course, this means that if you take any two elements of your um, of the, the structure sheaf, then the the der a derivation should satisfy the, uh, the the usual Leibniz rule. And again, you have inside this uh, endomorphism, the set of endomorphisms, you have the group of automorphisms, which are precisely the, the endomorphisms which satisfies this uh, second rule here. Okay, so it, it respects the multiplicate the multiplicative structure of the of the, the local ring. Okay, so the, the advantage is to, uh, now is to treat uh, the let's say the, the the derivations and the automorphisms in um, let's say as elements of a, com a common um, module, and this will be convenient for us. Of course, um, yeah, that's so that's what it is. Then again, uh, you can always you can also consider this the formal counterparts where instead of taking the, the local ring, you take its completion with respect to the to the powers of the maximal idea. So the and then you, you uh, this condition here uh, is uh, the one that uh, assures the continuity of the the formal counterparts. Um, so this is precisely what I mean by this. Um, the, the thing the, by saying that you you don't you don't have to displace from an arbitrary um, order the, the the powers of the, the the maximal idea. Yeah. So again, um, so the, the endomorphisms uh, they act on the local ring, okay, of course, and uh, but as a consequence, as a consequence, they act also on itself by conjugation. Okay, by which I mean that if you have two endomorphisms, psi and phi, and you have, a, let's say, a, a f, an element of the local ring, so of course you'd like to, to have this uh, equation here, right? So by which I mean that you define the action of psi on phi by, by the conjugation, right? So exactly as in the case of um, the group of the linear group acting on a, on a, on a, on a vector space. So now this is this, the fundamental definition. How now uh, they have this, what you call the maximal torus. What's the maximal torus? Is just a subgroup of the group of local automorphisms, which is isomorphic to the multiplicative group. Okay, so the the, multi, the, the, the multi, multiplicative group of order of um, rank n is just given by n copies of the of C star. Right, where multiplication is, uh, is component-wise multiplication. And now a maximal torus is an embedding of this multiplicative group on the automorphisms, okay? And uh, well, if you take uh, the, the, the infinitesimal generators of these automorphisms, we get um, a Lie algebra, which is called the, the, the Lie algebra of the maximal torus. And each element of this Lie algebra is a derivation, okay? And in fact, it's um, because the, the maximal torus is a commutative group. And uh, yeah, and uh, each element of this maximal torus, um, yeah, so due to this um, abelian structure of the maximal torus, you can show that this each element of this Lie algebra would be a semi-simple derivation lying here. So uh, example, if you take the, uh, let's say you fix local coordinates on a point P, 
then uh, there is the, the, the standard action of the torus on the local ring with respect to these coordinates, which is simply given by, by say that you take T1, Tn as non-zero complex numbers, and then you multiply T1 by X1, T2 by X2, and Tn by Xn. Okay. So if you take T1, Tn as an element of uh, C star to the power n, this, this simply give, this defines you a, the a torus, a torus action on the on the local ring, and uh, as a consequence, it, it defines a, a, an embedding of C star n on the autom on the automorphism. Okay, so this is a maximal torus. Um, in this case, uh, the associated Lie algebra is some is an object that we have already met uh, before, because if you take the, the infinitesimal generators of this action here, you simply obtain the the vector fields, the, let's say the the C module of vector fields with which which are logarithmic. Okay, so this is a n-dimensional submodule, C submodule. Okay, generated by x1 d over xn, xn d over xn. And of course, this is um, a, Lie, a commutative Lie algebra. And you can, you can see very easily that by integration, by integrating these vector fields, you get this action here, okay? Well, in this case, we are going to see that T is the standard torus associated to the coordinates x1, xn. And uh, let's let we denote it by this. Okay. So of course this is an example of a maximal torus embedded inside the, the group of automorphisms, right? But in fact, the proposition is that this is the only example in the sense that each maximal torus is the standard torus with respect to, the, to a convenient system of coordinates. Uh, so another way to say to see the, to say this is that given a maximal torus, you can always find an analytic system of coordinates such that the action of T is given by this on these coordinates. Okay. So what you prove this is it's um, in fact it's not very hard. Um, so as I said to you, uh, due to the fact that um, T uh, is a copy of um, of C star n. Each element of the Lie algebra uh, associated to T is a semi-simple. Okay, and moreover, um, all elements of this Lie algebra they commute they commute uh, between themselves. So now, if you use the Poincaré Dulux uh, normal form theorem, you can diagonalize each simultaneously each one of these uh, derivations which lie on the on the on t okay so you can each one of them is semi simple then of course you can diagonalize by uh, Poincaré Dulux uh, normal form formally but since they all commute between themselves you can moreover di diagonalize them simultaneously okay now uh, Uh, now, uh, so this means that you can always formally find a system of coordinates where uh, this torus action becomes the standard torus action. But again, uh, now you choose among one of uh, these um, uh, vector fields here, which uh, in the Lie algebra, one which has a generic spectrum. Okay, so it first you take one of the elements which, so of course this you can think of this as um as a a, a linear space of dimension n, where the let's say the the coordinates on the space are, are just the spectra of the of each element. So of course you can take one of the elements of, on this um, on this uh, Lie algebra which has an spectra which is q, uh, q linear independent, and by 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 taking uh, this uh, generic element, you easily see that this diagonalization which has been defined in the pre previous paragraph is unique okay why because if you look at the 
the, the set of changes of coordinates which centralizes an element which has a Q independent spectrum, you see that it's unique modulo uh, permutation of indices. Okay. So this explains the word the word unique here in the in the Denno sheet. And now uh, there is uh, one last step to show. So all of this is uh, formal, okay? Because uh, Punk, I recall to Poincaré Dulux uh, theorem is uh, in principle gives you a formal system of coordinates where uh, your torus would be diagonalized. But now um, I can uh, go a little bit further in the this choice of the generic element by taking um, an element, uh, let's say on the tor uh, on the Lie algebra T, such that its spectra is of a Bruno type. What I mean by Bruno type, it means that not only that the, these elements lambda one, lambda Q are Q linear independent as here, but moreover that uh, this set of numbers lambda K is not abnormally small. Okay? So not only they never vanish, which I mean, which is corresponding to say that it's Q linear, the spectra is Q linear independent, but moreover that it's very, it's in some sense, well bounded away from zero. So this is, uh, let's say, this is what we call uh, non-existence of small denominators. So if this holds, we can prove, so this is Bruno's uh, theorem, that uh, in fact, this linearization, let's say this map, which linearizes this element delta here, which in principle is only formal, is indeed analytic. It's indeed, so we have a convergence linearization. And by, conf by, by linearizing this element delta here, it's easy to see that you linearize altogether all elements in this um, uh, Lie algebra. And as a consequence, you diagonalize uh, this torus section. Okay, so by this uh, argument here, I show that each maximal torus is in fact a standard maximal torus. So why this is useful? Because um, uh, later on, we are going to see that we are going to need to compute the center and the normalizer of each one of these maximal torus. So what I mean by this, so the center of a maximal torus is the set of all in, in the, uh, all automorphisms of the local ring, which fixes pointwise each element of T. Okay, so as I said to you, the, the automorphisms, they act on the uh, themselves by, by, conjuga by conjugation. So we take each automorphism on T and then you conjugate by, by an element of, uh, of a general automorphism, you get a new automorphism, but in principle, it's, not, it's no longer on this maximal torus. So we define the center of T as all automorphisms which fix pointwise each element of T. And we define the normalizer of T as a set of all automorphisms which map T on itself. So uh, this theorem here, it says that, so of course the, the center is a normal subgroup of the normalizer. And this uh, theorem here says that um, when you take the quotient of the normalizer by the center, what you get is the symmetric group. Okay, so it simply says that you, um, yeah, so this is, um, why do you, how do you do this? In fact, essentially when you, you just have to consider the group of automorphisms which map the standard torus into itself. And you see that in this case, by explicit computations, since, since each maximal torus is of this form in an appropriate coordinate, it suffices to prove the result in this case. And in this case, by explicit computations, you see that uh, you can compute easily the normalizer and the center. And you see that um, this is uh, the so-called while group is given by the symmetric groups. It's just the, cha the, the change of coordinates, which maps, let's say, x1 to x2, x3 to x5, uh, and so on. Okay, so it just, it just permutates the coordinates. 
Okay, so this will be useful uh, later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now the, the essential thing, now the goal is to define this uh, geometric object, let's say this combinatorial object that I can call the, I'm going to call it the, the Newton polyhedra with respect to a maximal torus. And uh, this is based on the very, uh, this following uh, general fact. If you have a torus which acts linearly on a finite dimension vector space, then you can always define a direct sum decomposition, let's say of this space V, into a sum of graduated pieces. Okay, so what's uh, this uh, graduated pieces here? So you take for the, so this um, uh, so X of T is uh, what they call the group of characters of the the maximal torus of a torus. So it's just the the, the homomorphisms. The C homomorphism between T, sorry, the, the, the homomorphism over Z, sorry, from T to C star. Okay. Uh, and then the, the, the graduated piece is the graduated piece associated to, to uh, yeah, so the graduated piece associated to one of these characters, this piece here, is simply the set of vectors V such that for each element of the torus, the action of, uh, let's say T, the action of T on V gives you alpha of T times V. Okay. So this essentially is saying that um, this uh, graduated piece uh, of degree alpha is the set of, of vectors, which are eigenvectors for T, with associated um, eigenvalues, or this is eigenvalue alpha of t. Okay, so in the in the sense you are um, you are just taking the you, by by in a torus action, see if everything is commutative, you can just decompose v in a sum of, of eigen, uh, simultaneous eigenspaces for each one of these um, elements t. Okay, and the associated eigenvalue is uh, so the there is as uh, I say indexes by the, the associated eigenvalue v. Okay, so, so how do, do, does this translate in our setting? So you are going to recover a very well known, known objects here. So again, the, this is this is a holds for this the composition holds in um, finite dimensional vector spaces. But now we have to recall that uh, we are requiring our action to be local, in the sense that uh, this action of the torus preserves the maximal ideal. So by this condition, you can prove that uh, this action is, um, in some sense, filtered by the successive powers of the maximal ideal, and by by which meant that you can study this by as a, an inverse limit of the action of T on the jets on the finite jets of O, right? So this always it, so this is compatible with respect to the, to the truncations and gives you, a, again, a direct sum decomposition with respect to any, max, so given a, any maximal torus T, you have a direct sum decomposition of the local ring in this um, uh, infin infinite sum here, okay, in principle, uh, where each element uh, of this graduated piece is in some sort an homogeneous germ of degree alpha. So I'm going to give an example in a moment. But again, you have this direct sum decomposition of, of the local ring. But of course, since the, the torus acts by conjugation also on the endomorphisms, on the derivations, and on the automorphisms, you also have this decomposition on all uh, these uh, corresponding spaces. Okay. So, so again, example. Let's take the, the, the standard torus action acting on a, let's say, uh, in the diagonal way that I explained to you in a, a moment before, a moment ago. So uh, the, the diagonal action of the maximal torus on the variables x1 on the, let's say, on the, on the variables x1, x, xn induces an action on a monobial xk 
by so xk i mean by x1 k1 xk x n k n simply by by following the as follows so the if you if you look at the action of t1 tn on xk is just given by t to the power k xk right so this is simple and and then uh, using this you can see that in fact the the graduated piece of degree k so now uh, of course the the, the graduation uh, by using this identification you can identify the the character group the group of characters to uh, the to zn okay so in general the, there is an isom uh, there is a non-canonical isomorphism between the group of characters of uh, maximal torus and uh, zn and by fixing a diagonalizing system of coordinates you fix this isomorphism between the character group and zn okay so uh, these automorphisms this automorphism it maps let's say an element so in, in let's say in, by this identification the the character k maps the, the element t1 tn to t1 to the power k1 tn to the power kn okay and uh, by this identification the the the, the graduated piece of the local ring of degree k, where of course now k is a multi-index, okay, k1, k, kn. So the graduated piece of the local ring with respect to this, um, to k1, kn is simply given by uh, the one dimensional subspace, c subspace generated by the monomial xk, okay, because of this condition here. Okay, so um, when I have this maximal torus, uh, each one of the graduated pieces is of dimension one. So it really separates in, uh, in, in pieces of dimension one. Uh, as I said to you, you can also def uh, define this graduation on the set of vector fields. Okay, so the, the, the graduated piece of, of multi-degree K with respect to this maximal torus is simply given by x to the power k, so x1 to the power k1, x2 to the power k1, etc., times uh, this linear combination here, where c, uh, this, uh, you have this, uh, so in this case, uh, c here is, um, you have a, 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 comp a component of dimension n, okay, because you, have, you can choose freely this x, uh, this uh, coefficients multiplying x over dx1 and xn d over xn. And uh, of course, the, the graduated piece of multi-degree K of uh, the endomorphisms are given by the endomorphisms, which map for each n, it maps, it, it maps the monomial Cn to the monomial Cn plus K. So it displaces by a multi, so this is all, again a multi-index notation, right? So it, it displaces by K indexes, um, by, by vector K, each one of the, the exponents. Uh, well, uh, somehow to, uh, sometimes to make the computations, it's easier to, to compute this with respect to the Lie algebra of T. So it's a, it gives exactly the same graduation. So for instance, um, the graduated piece of multi-index K of the local ring is given by all germs F such that D over DX1 of F X equals to k1 of f, etc., and d over d x n of f is given by k of n times f. Okay. Of course, if you take the, the let's say the Taylor expansion of f with respect to the to the variables x1, xn, you see that these conditions means precisely that f has only one monomial, which should, which should be of this form here, right? So. This can find a bigger data. Uh, okay. Sorry if it, it sorry if it's too um, abstract, but uh, I need these definitions uh, in order to formulate properly my my setting. 
Yeah, so now I, I finally arrived to this notion of, um, let's say, Newton polyhedron with respect to the maximal torus. So I recall to you that um, uh, given a maximal torus, you can decompose uh, the spaces in graduated pieces where each piece has a multi-degree with respect to the, to the um, character group of the torus. Okay. So now you take any endomorphism. Okay. So sorry, I'm going to go back a moment. So as I, I, I remember, I, I recall to you that the, the module of endomorphisms also has a direct sum decomposition as this, okay? Because T acts on the endomorphisms by conjugation, okay? Since T is an, an endomorphism itself. So I'm going to use this graduation, this direct sum decomposition to decompose a given endomorphism as a direct sum of this, where phi alpha is the component on the graduated, uh, let's say is the component of phi in the graduated piece of degree alpha. And now I define the support of phi with respect to this maximal torus as a set of all characters such that the associated graduated piece is non-zero, okay? So now the support is a subset of the set of characters. Okay. Now, as I said to you, I can, by fixing a local system of coordinates, I can identify the support with uh, Zn, okay. because this is a, a maximal torus and uh, you can always think as this, as this is the, as the standard maximal torus associated to a system of coordinates. So uh, by this identification, um, you now define the Newton polyhedron of phi with respect to the maximal torus as the convex envelope of the support plus the positive quadrant. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the same definition that I've given before, but now using this more uh, abstract setting here. So of course, um, uh, in principle, this definition depends on the choice of identification of X, T with uh, Zn, okay? But uh, all the features that are, we are going to extract from this Newton polyhedron will not depend on this identification here. Yeah, Daniel? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the case of vector fields, so uh, you had also Newton polygon uh, who could have uh, negative coordinates, but at, they could be at most minus one, right? Yes. So it's not the case here, I guess. Yes. Yes. I'm going to give an example. Yes. Is the okay. Case. Okay. Um, so uh, this this general definition it works for any endomorphism. Okay. So okay. among these endomorphisms, there is the function germs, which are so, uh, so sorry, among these endomorphisms, there, there are all the differential operators. So a differential operator is an endomorphism of the local ring. So it, it maps the local ring into itself. So, um, but they have a particular feature that in this case, if you have a degree D differential operator, then this support cannot be anything. It has to, to lie in a very precise region that I'm going to show to you in, uh, right now in the, in, the, in the example in a moment, okay? So, so how, the, how it works? Uh, so I said that if phi is a differential operator of order D, how do you compute the support? You do as follows. So uh, let's suppose that uh, T is the standard uh, maximal torus for some system of coordinates X1, Xn. Then you compute the expansion of a phi with respect uh, written in this form. So I recall to you that now, um, again, uh, as in the case of vector physics, I have to force the appearance of these polynomials. Uh, so this is a multi-variable polynomial of degree smaller or equal than D, which is computed on the logarithmic basis, okay? So this um, P 
each one of the, this PS is a polynomial in n variables of degree at most d, where d is the order of the, the differential operator. And uh, now uh, you each one of these parts is multiplied by a monomial x to the power s. Okay. So in some sense, the, this part here uh, gives you a, a, a graduated piece of degree zero. And then when you multiply by s, you have a graduated piece of degree s. Okay. So the, the support of phi with respect to the maximal torus which is the standard one in these coordinates, is just given by writing this expansion. And then looking at all multi-index S, such that the associated polynomial P of S is non-zero. So as I said to you, in principle, um, this indexation, so S here by, by my identification of the character group of with, uh, with z to the power n, this s here is indexes, is indexed in a z to the power n. Okay, but um, we see that if there is a differential operator of order d, uh, what happens is that by forcing the appearance of this uh, logarithmic basis here, you should sometime take s to be negative. Okay, but not too much negative. At most, uh, it, let's say each entry of S is greater or equal than minus D, where D is the order of the, of the operator. So I'll give, I'll give an example. So of course, in the zero dimensional, the order, the order zero case, so this is the traditional case of differential operators of order zero. So these are just function germs. Okay, so they, uh, I have already seen this example. So if you write y, f as y to the square minus x to the power three, right? So in this case, um, you have the support is uh, this one, and this is the Newton polygon of f with respect to the maximal torus. Okay. Then for vector field differential operator for the one, now you can have negative vertices in the polyhedron. Sorry. Yeah, so again, I forced the appearance of this uh, logarithmic basis here, okay? And by, by forcing this, I eventually have contributions can, coming from um, negative vertices, which means that, um, well, for, for those people which knows uh, the, the, let's say the, the corresponding objects in the, in the Lie algebra setting, this means that the weight spaces for the, for the, the associated D algebra has, uh, has negative weights here. So okay, so the minus one, uh, you can have minus one, a vertex minus one, minus one, one, and a vertex is two minus one. And finally, the, the new situation we have, a, a, let's, say, let's take the heat equation, right? So the heat equation is a differential operator of order two. And now I'm going to enforce the appearance of this logarithmic basis, okay? So for, for computational purposes, is better to, to write, is not, is, is to write these polynomials in D, sorry, in X, D over DX and T over DT by using this, which is called the, the Frobenius differential operator. Okay, so what's the Frobenius? It's just a, let's say it's a, it's just a notation, right? So this is a polynomial in D over DX of degree two which is a, a, just a polynomial where you take this combinatorial, let's say the binomial coefficient and put in the place of N, you, you just put uh, D over DX. Okay, so this is a polynomial of degree two in D over DX, sorry. And this is a polynomial of degree one and T over DT. Okay. And when you, you write now uh, the, the phi, in this, using this basis, you, you get, you have to put here the, the coefficient x to the power minus two, and here t to the power minus one. Okay, so, so you have two, you have two monomials, so, sorry, two vertices. One is situated at, uh, let's say, on the position minus two zero, the first one, 
and the second one in the position t, uh, sorry, zero minus one, which is here. Okay, so now you see you have these two negative uh, vertices, and uh, there is a, a, a vertex at, at position minus two because let's say this is the worst possible situation since the, operator, the differential operator is of order two. If it were of order d, then you could get something of the a vertex at position minus d zero, for instance. Okay. Okay. So again, we have this phenomenon, which uh, in some sense is inevitable, is the appearance of these negative vertices in the polyhedron with respect to any to, to a given maximal torus. Okay. So in fact, if you change the maximal torus, uh, this uh, phenomenon will persist because it's uh, intrinsically attached to the, to the object. Okay, so now uh, there is, so I've, I have defined the, the polyhedron of an endomorphism with respect to a maximal torus. And this is precisely one of the objects is very useful in the geometric invariant theory. So there is um, something I, I'm going to, to explain in a moment, which is called the Hilbert Manford criteria. But I'm going to just to, to adopt the following dichotomy between uh, the situation that can appear when considering the, the Newton polyhedra of an endomorphism. There are two possible situations. The first one is the so-called unstable situation where there exists a maximal torus such that the Newton polyhedron of the endomorphism with respect to the maximal torus does, uh, does not contain the origin. Okay. So this is the so-called unstable situation. So I recall to you that the, we are here where I studied the germ of a differential operator in a point P on the manifold. Right, so everything here is germified on a point. And the second situation is that the germ of endomorphism at the point P is semi-stable if for all maximal torus, zero lies on the Newton polyhedron, okay? So if you recall uh, what I have done in the case of, uh, of vector fields, these were precisely the, the dichotomy which separated the case of nilpotent germ are the case of an elementary germ. Okay, so now we are some sort of generalizing this for the, for the case of any of any order differential operator. Okay. So now, uh, so this defines a, a germ of endomorphism. Let's say this this condition co corresponds to let's say a, a property of a, a, the germ of a, an endomorphism at a point. And now from a global point of view, we're going to say that um, the unstable locus of an endomorphism is the set of point P, such that the germ of phi at the point P is unstable. Okay. So this is a, um, the, the, let's say for us, this will be the bad locus. So this is the, the set of points that we would like to eliminate by our resolution process. So this is my proposition for the, the set of um, points that should be, um, should disappear by uh, this uh, sequence of uh, blowing ups. Well, so why I, I think it's uh, not so bad because in the case of, um, let's say where phi is of order zero, I recall that this means that um, phi is given by a scalar multiplication operator. So what's the, the unstable locus in this case? The, stable, uh, the unstable locus is simply the variety defined by f, okay? So it means that if you, uh, if you look at the, the Newton polygon of a function with respect to, to, sorry, the polyhedron of a function with respect to any maximal torus, it locally it contains zero if and only if the function f vanishes on p. <clears throat> okay. So this um, <clears throat> sorry, p p is on the unstable locus if and only if f the germ of f on p lies on the maximal ideal. Okay. 
<clears throat> and for a differential operator of um, order one, take the case that we, we have studied, let's say in general, a differential operator of order one is just, you have a, compo a, a component of degree zero, of order zero, sorry, which is a multiplication, and a component of order one, which is a derivation like this, okay? So the case that, that we have mostly studied up to now is the case where you don't have a component of the of order zero, but even in this case we have, we have just we have a component of order zero and a component of order one. The characterization the characterization of the unstable locus is, is is also easy because a point P is on the unstable locus if and only if f so the the degree, the order zero component vanishes on P and the order one component is locally nilpotent. Okay, where I recall that being locally, that uh, a derivation is nilpotent if it preserves the maximal ideal and the same simple part vanishes. <clears throat> okay, so this is not very, very hard to prove. Well, in this case, it's, um, if you look at the definition of, uh, of the instability, you see that um, it is that you can, um, in the case where you have an unstable point, it means that you can separate the Newton polyhedron from zero by a hyperplane. And of course, this, all, this is always possible. <clears throat> Let's say in the case of a function, if um, there is no vertex, vertex, vertex uh, at, at the origin. So it, it, this is why this condition holds. Sorry, I have to drink something. <clears throat> so, um, and this, this second property here is a characterization of the nilpotent locus that I have given to you, um, let's say, to, I think two sessions before, this is two sessions ago. This means this is precisely the, the, the condition of nil potency that I explained to you. Okay, so, so this definition, it's a, it works nicely in the, well, in the known cases. And um, uh, now I, I would like to, to, to understand this unstable locus in the, in the case of higher order differential operators. Okay. So for instance, there, there is a very basic question, which is quite tricky. And uh, I'm going to explain to you that I don't know how to prove that this unstable locus is a closed subset. Okay, this, I will explain to you why. And this is, the, I think, the last thing that I want you to show to you today. So, but before explaining why this is quite tricky to study this object uh, in general, you have to, to, to look at this, at the definition that here you see that there is a quantifier here, right? To say that it's unstable if there exists a maximum torus such that so, etc. So, in fact, in order to to look at this um, at this unstable locus from a, let's say an analytic point of view to prove, for instance, that this is an, an analytic subset of the ambient space, you we should be able somehow to eliminate this quantifier here, okay? and say that the unstable locus is defined by some set of analytic equations. Okay, so now um, to explain this, I, I'm going to, to give an alternative characterization of the instability via one parameter subgroups. So the, what's a one parameter subgroup? It's a torus of dimension one, right? So this is given by um, an embedding of C star into the group of, automorph of local automorphisms. So this is just, a, let's say, um, a, a copy of a one-dimensional torus inside the automorphism group. And let's call Li lambda, it's a <coughs> Li, Li algebra, okay? So again, an example, this is an object that we have already met um, several times. If you fix local coordinates x1, xn, we can consider the C star action on the local ring given by as follows. So you have a T, um, an element of a C star, and it applies, it, given, it gives, um, it maps the 
first variable x1 to t to the power of omega 1 xn and xn to the t to the power of omega n xn. Okay. Where now, of course, um, you since you have to you want to have some analytic object. Okay. So it should be an, a, a subgroup of the automorphic groups. This omega 1 uh, omega n should be integers, okay, non-zero integers. Sorry, no, sorry. Some of them can be can be zero, but the, the, the vector itself is not is not is non zero. Well, now we see that the lambda is positive if all this omega one omega n can be chosen of the same sign. Okay, so this um, a notion that I'm going to use in a moment. But in principle, it, we could have some some of them negative and other positive. But for 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 us, the most interesting case is the case where all will be positive. <clears throat> so, okay, in this case, again, the, the associated Lie algebra is very easy, is very easy to compute. Is uh, if you take this vector field here and you integrate this vector field, you see that its flow is given by its time t flow. Yeah, it's let's say time uh, t flow is, is given by something out, is, is defines this action here. <clears throat> Okay, again, so uh, as I said, this is an example of a one parameter group, but again, by poincare dulacs theorem, each one parameter group can be put in this form here okay, by, a, by a, an appropriate choice of, choice of coordinates. So you can, so uh, the Lie algebra, again, the, you can use the poincare dulacs theorem because the Lie algebra is generated by a semi-simple derivation since the Lie algebra is the Lie algebra for torus. And then you can diagonalize this semi-simple element through the poincare dulac theorem. And finally, you can prove that uh, this, so there's a profound theorem for, of Bruno. Well, it, in fact, it's much easier in the case where the lambda, let's say, where the weights are, are all, all positive, because in this case, it's, uh, you don't have to use the, the whole Bruno's theorem to prove that this diagonalizing system of coordinates is analytic, but even in the case you have non-positive um, weights, non-positive elements in this vector one omega one omega n, you can prove that by Bruno's uh, condition B theorem that this diagonalization can be chosen um, analytic to be analytic. <clears throat> so okay, so this is in fact the, the only example up to a convenient choice of coordinates of a, a, a one-parameter subgroup of a, the term of automorphisms. And of course, each one-parameter group is contained in a maximal torus. Why? Because once you diagonalize this one-parameter group, read, uh, to write it in this form, of course, it is contained in the maximal torus, which is the standard maximal torus associated to the system of coordinates, right? So this automatically, automatically gives you the, the property that each one parameter group is contained in the maximal torus. But uh, of course, this torus is far from being unique in the sense that uh, a one parameter group can, can be contained in several different torus. And uh, well, the, the analogy to, to keep in mind is that, uh, let's say, if you take the, the linear group on a finite dimension of vector space, uh, a maximal torus should be thinking, uh, should be think as a way to choose a basis of V, okay? So, so fix, to fix a maximal torus corresponds to choose a basis on V, but uh, a one parameter group corresponds to the fact that uh, you can, a non-zero ve non vector can belong to infinitely many distinct bases. So this is the, the analogy that you have to keep in mind here. <clears throat> so you can complete any non-zero vector to any, any infinite basis. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so I have time to explain this. Yeah, so there is an important fact that we're going to use also later on, but I'm going to, to show it to you now, is the following thing. So. Um, Let's let's call for any group G. Let's call a uh, gamma of G the set of all one-parameter subgroups of G. 
Okay, so this is a group of all torus embedded on G. And now you can, of course, you can make G act on this gamma of G by conjugation, right? So if you have a one parameter subgroup of uh, the torus and you have an element, sorry, if you have one parameter group of, of any group G, let's say an, an algebra, a linear algebra group, linear, you can make, you can give, you can have a new one parameter group by conjugation, right? So you take, you take G times lambda, which is the conjugation of G of lambda by G. And this gives you a new one parameter group. So this defines an action of G on gamma G. Okay. So now we, we are going to use later on the, the, the set of equivalence classes of gamma of G under this action by G. Okay. So we see that two one parameter groups are conjugated if there is an element of G, which maps one to the other according to this action, right? So by what, what will be important for us is the following thing in our context, for each maximal torus T contained in the automorphous group, you can define the set of all one parameter groups, one parameter subgroups of the automorphism group, quotiented by the action of the automorphism by conjugation. Okay, so this is the, the, the object here in this infinite dimensional setting here. Okay, but now there is a very nice description because this is exactly the same thing. Uh, yeah, so um, the, the equivalence class here is the same thing as taking for, you fix one maximal torus, you take, I, hope I should have written here, you take the set of all one parameter groups which are inside this maximal torus, and then you have the action of the, the, the one parameter group, so, sorry, the maximal torus itself on its set of one parameter groups. Okay. And uh, I mean that this quotient here is precisely the quotient of the normalizer of T by the centralizer of T, okay? So in fact, if you want to look at all the equivalence classes of one parameter groups in the group of automorphisms, it's the same, it's the same thing as this quotient, which is uh, we have seen a moment ago, it's uh, what we call the wild group, and it's um, isomorphic to the symmetric group of permutations of uh, any elements. So the, the, the proof is quite easy because um, let's, let's look at the, uh, the orbit of a one parameter group by this action here, okay? So uh, I recall to you that each one parameter group is contained in a maximal torus. And then this maximal torus can be conjugated by an autologous to the standard maximal torus in a, let's say in one coordinate system, okay? So, everything is, is um, given by an action of uh, automorphism by, by conjugation. And when you map this one parameter group in the standard, let's say the standard torus associated to, the, to, um, to, a, to a system of coordinates, then you can just study the action of the automorphism group by conjugation, on the elements of this uh, maximal torus, okay? And this is precisely this uh, set here, okay? So you map, so you take a one parameter group, you map it inside the standard maximal torus, and then you just consider the action inside this, which preserves this maximal torus, which is the normalizer, right? Uh, Quotiated by the centralized because the centralized corresponds to, to the trivial actions. But you have seen that this is simply the, the symmetric group. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I go just go back to this, what I, I said to you. So the, the, the goal now is to define 
Let's just call it vector. So how to characterize the, the instability now using this one parameter groups instead of taking the, 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 the maximal tori, the, the maximal tori. So for each one parameter group, since it's, a, it's also a torus action, it corresponds to a torus action, you have a direct sum decomposition, okay? Of the, let's say of the local ring as a sum of graduated pieces. But now, uh, since the torus is of dimension one, uh, this graduation is indexed by Z up to a, a non-canonical ident identification of the group of characters with Z. Okay. So you have this graduated pieces, and um, now you have this direct sum, which of course uh, also gives you a direct sum of the endomorphisms, of the derivations, and of the automorphisms. Okay, so just an example here. If you take the, let's say, the one parameter group lambda of t on dimension two, which acts on the two variables, x and y, let's say you are in two variables, right? By x go to the t to the power alpha times x, and y goes to the t to the power beta times y, okay? Where with alpha and beta, uh, non-zero vector, then in this case, of course, the graduated piece of degree K is given by all polynomial, all germs F, which are alpha, beta, quasi homogeneous of degree K, right? So this is, um, this is precisely the equation which give, defines you the, the graduated piece of degree K. <clears throat> okay. So for instance, if you take, um, let's say, if you take the, the, the diagram of exponents of F, let's say we take the, the weights alpha and beta it equals to one minus one, uh, these uh, parallel lines here correspond to the graduated pieces of the Greek, uh, K equals to zero, K equals to minus one, K equals to one and so on. Okay, so you see that here, in this case, a graduated piece can have an infinite number of monomials. Of course, okay, so each, each integral point on this um, dashed line here corresponds to uh, a graduated monomial of a given degree. Mm, of course, this cannot happen if the, the, the one parameter group is positive, as I said to you, in the case where the, the, the one parameter group has only positive weights, which is not the case here, of course, then each one of these graduated pieces is finite dimension. Over C. Yeah, okay. So now I take, as again, again, as in the case of maximal tori, I, I take any endomorphism. I, I, consider, I consider its direct sum decomposition. And I, I claim the following. So, sorry, I consider its direct sum decomposition with respect to the graduation defined by a given one parameter group. Okay. So, now there is this uh, equivalent characterization of the instability. We say that a germ, the germ of phi at a point is unstable. Mm -hmm. If and only if we can find a positive one parameter group such that the support of phi with respect to this one parameter group lies on the positive graduate, graduated part. Okay, so by which I mean that, um, so now, of course, then, uh, since we, we are in the case of um, a torus of dimension one, this, the polyhedron, let's say, the polyhedron of um, phi with respect to this is a one dimensional object, okay? Because we, this, in the, this is indexed by, by Z, okay? So this condition means that this, Polyhedron, this one dimensional polyhedron is situated on the right with respect to the origin. It's strictly on the right with respect to the origin. Okay. So, what's the proof of this? It's very easy, in fact, in fact because uh, I'm I I only going to give a, a visual proof because it's the uh, same thing with, uh, we have already seen. Um, the proof is the following. And so, uh, again, suppose that let's prove in one direction. So, you suppose that. Um, phi 
is unstable with respect to our preview, our previous um, definition. So by which I mean that it's Newton polyhedron with respect to a maximal torus can be separated from the origin by a hyperplane, right? So, but now if you take the one parameter group, which is defined by this, um, let's say by this vector, which I denoted by this arrow here. So this is a vector of um, coordinates omega one, omega n. So this, uh, this is precisely the one parameter group contained in this maximal torus for which, uh, so the Newton polyhedron with respect to this one dimensional parameter group will have all monomials lying above this dashed line here. Okay, so this, uh, this means that you, you have precisely this second condition with respect to the lambda, which is chosen uh, according to this uh, arrow here. Okay. And the reciprocal is, is quite easy also because if you have this condition, this second condition, I can always embed uh, lambda in a maximal torus where this configuration holds. Okay. Yeah, so this is. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to finish with this, this, uh, this uh, open question that. Um, in fact, I'm going to, to partially answer, uh, answer next, next time, but there's not completely. So the, the above discussion implies that uh, if the order of the differential operator is more than equal than one, then its instability locus is closed. Why? Because I recall to you that I just go back and some, because in the case where the order of phi is zero, then the stability locus is just the support of the ideal shift defined by F. So of course, this is a closed subset. And in the case of where the order of, of, phi, of phi is, of phi is um, one, then the instability locus is also defined by these two conditions, which are both closed. Okay? They are defined by analytic equations. So in both cases, the, this um, stable, unstable locus is a closed analytic subset or algebraic set, depending on the, on the, on the category that you work. Yeah, but what happens? Yeah, so uh, sorry, I, I, I just repeated here uh, this same remarks that if a fee is given by a derivation, the condition of uh, instability, the, the condition of being in the, in the potent locus is given by, say, by saying that the, <clears throat> the semi simple part of the Jordan decomposition of delta is equal to zero. But why this is a, a, an algebraic condition? Because this is equivalent to say the following thing. You just look at the linearization of your derivation so this is a linear endomorphism of M quotiented by M squared with, a, let's say it's a finite dimensional vector space. And now this is, a, let's say, it's an endomorphism given by some matrix. And to say that the semi-simple part is zero is precisely saying that this linear endomorphism here is nilpotent, okay? which on its turn is exactly the same thing as saying that it's, um, let's say the, the characteristic polynomial associated to this linear endomorphism is trivial. So every, every coefficient of the characteristic polynomial vanishes except the, let's say the, the higher order term. So this gives you, gives you of course, um, an algebraic condition on the coefficients of this matrix which in turn gives you an analytic condition on the germ of, of, of uh, delta on the point P. So this, 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 this explains why this is a uh, closed condition, instability, okay? <clears throat> um, yeah. So uh, for the moment, this is an open problem. So um, 
to prove that this set is closed for higher dimensional, uh, so let's say for high, higher order differential operators. I don't know if it's, if it's true. Uh, so I, as I said to you, I know that this is true if the order of uh, phi is smaller than equal than one, but I don't know if it's true for higher order differential operators. And so uh, in order to, let's say to, 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 to work with this, I have weakened a little bit this condition by saying what, what they call a strongly unstable locus, which I, 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 able, I am able to prove that this is, um, it's, this is a, um, a closed set. So what's, um, I want to finish with this. So it's what's the strongly sta unstable set. So, uh, so it's unstable in the preceding sense, by which I mean that uh, there exists some maximal torus T such that the Newton, Newton polyhedron of phi with respect to T does not contain the origin, but I have to ask this additional condition here that phi should preserve the filtration of the local ring given by the powers of the maximal idea. Okay, so uh, I'm going to explain why this first condition is not um, is not empty, right? So take this example. So I'm going to finish with this. Okay. So this is a second order differential operator. Okay, so you just take x to the power minus one, y, x. So, and now I'm going to draw its Newton polyhedron. In this case, it's a polygon of dimension two. So it has one monomial here, minus one, one, sorry, minus two, one, and four, zero. Four. And you see that um, the Newton polyhedron is separated from the origin because uh, you can always draw a straight line here which is just below this uh, edge here, which separates the, poly the, the polygon from zero, right? So this point, this germ is unstable according to our previous definition, but it's not strongly unstable. Why? Because uh, this first condition here requires, in fact, the following thing that if you draw, if you draw this is equivalent to this, if you draw this dashed line, which it's the line of slope minus uh, of slope minus one, the all the the vertices of the corresponding polygon should be above this line. So this is the precisely uh, the geometric way to see this condition. Okay. So of course this is, this not, does not hold in this uh, in this example. So this is a, an example of a situation which is which is unstable but it's not strongly unstable. Okay. So what, I, yeah, well, I, I don't have time to prove this, but uh, what I'm going to prove in the next time is that I, I denote by strongly unstable, the set of points where the germ of phi is, uh, is uh, satisfy this condition. So it's his S unstable phi. So it's so obvious contained, contained in, the, in the unstable locus. And this is the set that I'm going to prove, I, I'm going to prove that it's closed, okay? So by doing this, this I, I'm going to show to you um, on the next session, how this um, geometric invariant theory enters in the game in a very strong way to prove this property here. And now uh, how it works also to, to, to give you a strategy that I hope we will work in higher dimensions. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll just stop here. Thank you, Daniel. I stop the recording.